Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. Welcome to Spill and Dish, a new podcast from the Specialty Food Association. Founded in 1952, SFA is the leading trade association and source of information about the $170 billion specialty food industry. We champion the food producers, retailers, and other buyers who make up the specialty food world. Each episode, we want to share the stories behind the products made and sold by our members who are helping shape the future of food. You can listen and discover the inspiration, recipe, craft, culture, ingredients, and production methods that help answer the question, what makes specialty food special? I'm today's host, Megan Rooney, Education Manager at SFA. We're excited to bring you today's episode and so happy to be working with Heritage Radio Network, a nonprofit podcast network covering the world of food, drink, and agriculture, and expanding the way eaters think about food. Today's guest is Michael Antonorsi, owner of Wild Joy Goods and Chu Wow Chocolatier. Chef Michael Antonorsi shares many passions, chocolate and quality foods are just a few. Fueled by innovation and a desire to impact the world, Chef Michael shares joy through his vision of deliciously engaging food experiences. As a self-proclaimed chocoholic, I know how much joy chocolate brings me, so I am very thrilled to be speaking with a chief joy activator in the flesh. Welcome, Michael. Well, well, thank you for having me here, Megan. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So we'll get right into it. What does your company produce? We make uh, high-end gourmet chocolates with fun expressions of combinations of things that normally don't necessarily come together in chocolate, but uh, somehow elicit experiences that are memorable and shareable, you know, like our potato chips or a s'mores bar or firecracker bar, which pops in your mouth. And uh, we just recently launched a carrot cake one. So fun ideas, fun concepts that we deliver with high quality product. Wonderful. And yeah, the potato chip bar was the first one that I've ever seen in a store many years ago. So good. Still my favorite. It's delicious. It's a classic. How many years have you been in the industry? Oh, we're turning 20 this September. So we're full on adults now. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. Um, did you have a food background before launching your company? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a biomedical engineer, not really into food. And I worked for 14 years in computer networking and telecommunications. But my passion was about food ever since I finished college in UCSD. And I'm from Venezuela, so I went back to Venezuela, did all these other things to be able to first please my parents, of course. But then after that, I was able to afford my passion and I uprooted my family uh, and went to Paris. And there at 34 or so, I became a chef and then specialized in chocolate making and pastry making. And since I had such a great experience in San Diego, we decided to set shop in San Diego and start a uh, gourmet chocolate uh, business way back in 2002, where actually chocolate was pretty basic in the United States and, and, and the chocolate movement just started to begin to, to get more interesting. And, and we were one of those uh, first ones out there. Amazing. And I'm sure that 
what you've learned in your past career has helped you so far. Is that right? <laughs> well, you know how they say humans always trip on the same, you know, stone. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, for sure it helps. Uh, it helps you in problem solving and everything. But, you know, we went from technology to food and, you know, packaged goods and all that. So we had to learn a lot. And uh, one thing we did learn is that as an entrepreneur, you know, you're normally very full of yourself. You know, you're so self-centered in what you think you're and you're passionate about it. But you forget to connect with people. So like our first mistake is, which is not a mistake, but could be a happy mistake, is the choice of a name for our company, which is Chew Wow. Right. So I didn't know that for the English language or English speakers, putting three vowels together was so difficult. So we've been called Cho, Chi, Chihuahua, any kind of word you can imagine. Until one reporter finally said, oh, you chew and say, wow, chew, wow. So now we say, like, if it's not a wow, it's not a chew wow. So you start learning how to really communicate with people. And, uh, and then we started creating these innovative flavors. And our first tagline was to be unusual, unexpected, and delicious. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, of course, everybody wants to be discovering things. And I didn't understand that then that unusual and unexpected is not welcomed. However, delicious, it is welcome. So, you know, we start, okay, we're just getting, we're too far out there. We need to really come down to things that, that somehow uh, connect with our consumers. So now, after that, that's potato chip came out and s'mores. And we started doing bars that somehow have familiar elements to it and combining them in a way that, you know, give an experience that uh, either evokes uh, historic, you know, uh, memories or actually, you know, compels you to share with other people. Yeah, and once you hook them with those, then they're willing to be a little more adventurous. Right. And that's what we realized that, you know, we're not a chocolate company. We actually just share joy with the world through the, the chocolate experiences. And, and it's more fun to not have to sell a product but an experience, even though the product is what delivers it. And what better way to deliver joy than chocolate? It's the perfect package. <laughs> um, how did you get involved in specialty foods? Well, you know, the nature of a product being gourmet and uh, and premium and uh, the FCFA is just the right place to be, you know, because this show for us has been, you know, a wonderful show. Uh, It allows us to present our high quality product, connect with, you know, good leads and uh, and, uh, connections with distributors and, and retailers. So, you know, we started already, I don't know, 17 or so years ago, uh, exhibiting with you guys and it's been fun. How did the idea for the product and company come about? I know you mentioned Venezuela, and I read a little bit about your background and a little bit about your family's land there. I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, well, coming from Venezuela, where the finest cacao is grown in the world, I know that you know probably Peruvians and Ecuadorians say the same, but honestly, you know the criollo bean and all that uh, is one of the finest cacaos that can be uh, available anywhere. Uh, we wanted to bring that uh, to the expression of the chocolates that we make in the United States. And uh, we chose the name Chuao also because Chuao is a cacao growing region in Venezuela. And we wanted to kind of eventually go full circle where we open the market for the cacao growing region and then we can kind of go back to them, you know, where we can distribute some of that value at. Venezuela, unfortunately, has gone down and become a broken country. And uh, we haven't really been able to close that loop. But uh, we chose the name mainly to, you know, really portray the high quality of our chocolate. And... Uh, the cacao in Venezuela is so high quality that you would almost have to import cacao to make bad chocolate. And, and companies like even Nestle in Venezuela would make a way better bar there than they could make it anywhere else mm-hmm. because they have such readily available high quality cacao. And uh, in my, you know, my great grandfather, we had, they had a cacao plantation that now has been all you know, invaded and, and kind of lost. That was called Agua Santa. And we wanted to kind of keep all that together. And as I went to Paris to become a chef, I had those tools available. And sort of bringing uh, the, you know, the, the know-how with the, the traditions and origins. And, so, and being in California allows us the freedom to create things that are not traditional. So it all kind of came together. Mm-hmm. And we started putting spices. Like our first bar was a spicy Maya bar. So we're putting chilies in it in like 2003. And then it was great when Lind came out with one bar, kind of like saying, oh, I guess we were doing the right thing. Yeah. When the big guys follow your lead, that's yeah. a good sign. Awesome. Where did your love of food come from? Oh, I don't know. I think it's chromosomatic. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, I just I dream about food, think about food 24-7, you know. Um, it's just uh, so much fun. And I, the whole digestive system is such an enjoyable system, you know, and, then, and the visuals and the combinations in your head, anticipation of flavors. 
So when I was growing up, yeah, you know, of course, my mother would cook and everything, but I was always curious. When I was in college, I started really cooking, and, and I really fell in love with it. And then I would take cooking classes, weekend classes, and my biggest bucket list thing when I was 16 was to go to France and become a chef. And uh, it took me, you know, I did 14 years of telecommunications to be able to afford myself my passion. And I, I was glad that I did because I would have just continued, you know, grinding in the technological world but, and then cooking for hobby. But when you can line up your passion with your work, work becomes play. So then the hours don't matter, you know, you know the, the days of the week don't matter. You're just always, you know, playing even though it's work. So that was, yeah. and it's just been like that. Yeah, and you took your whole family along for the ride, right? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, and, and companies in many times are also your family extension in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at how a company evolves when it's a small company that it's privately owned by family or something, it, it behaves like the whole family behaves, you know, and, and, and you go through your tantrum years and then you go into your narcissistic teenagehood and you think you're almighty and powerful and then you get hit in the head a few times and then, you mature into more, okay, I know where I belong, I know where I don't belong, you know, you set greed aside, you can start making more wise choices, and, and you mature. And, uh, and it's just how you see your children grow, right? So I've seen my children grow through this journey of 20 years, and now they're all in their 20s, and, and it's wonderful how we have parallels. So this is my fourth child. Yes, <laughs> your fourth, your youngest. So speaking of, you know, some of those growing pains, what were some of the obstacles that you faced in bringing your brand to market? Uh, you know, in general, we have done it all kind of uh, through passion and, and, and hard work. Uh, never really had access to resources that would accelerate processes. And uh, we always really uh, thrived in our innovation that brought attention. So we had a lot of media attention just by content itself. We didn't have to pay for it because people wanted to talk about what we're doing. And that really supported us a lot. And, uh, but the first years, as we were so self-centered, we didn't really have packaging or naming that would be logical. You know, first, we, we already choose a company name that's difficult. I hope that, you know, Chuao becomes as familiar as Hagen does, which is also kind of like a weird name. But, and you chew and say, wow, remember that? And, uh, and then we started really uh, uh, looking into what we can do. But before, we were just doing it in a very, um, you know, blind way. Like, for instance, we had a, a chocolate bar. We have a chocolate bar. It used to be called Panko. So we use panko breadcrumbs in it and dark chocolate, and it's kind of crunchy and all that. And we call it panko. And it was a golden packaging, had nothing but little cacao pods, and said panko. And I'm expecting everybody to understand what that is. And if anybody knows what panko is, which is not very many people, they think it's maybe a bag of panko breadcrumbs, right? Who knows? It's a chocolate bar. It's already not usefully related to chocolate bar. So we did one thing with Godiva a long time ago where we... We played with them, and they took us to 250 stores, and they wanted to have a chef-type-driven thing, and they taught us so much about marketing. So they completely started changing our names and said, no, you cannot be called, but it's Panko. You know? So we call now the bar Panko. is called Salted Chocolate Crunch. And, it, you know, would you buy a thing that called Panko, or would you buy something that says Salted Chocolate Crunch? And we started really reformulating everything and understanding uh, that you need, you know, you have a very short time to be, uh, engage with a potential customer, and if you're making it difficult for them to understand who you are, then they're just going to pass. But if you make it clear, so we change our branding. You know, as a company, we struggled for nine years. Honestly, you know, we lost money for nine years, and uh, because we were just thinking that everybody needs to understand what we are. Uh, but then we decided to do something different because when I understood that we actually just connecting with people through the joy that they experience of the chocolate. Uh, and we did all this, this understanding of changing packaging and names. We decided to put like a mouthwatering picture in front of the bars and, uh, you know, clear names. You know, like we have the carrot cake. You know, we're not creating this fancy name. It's just carrot cake, right? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, we just, you know, we broke even the next year. We grew 150% the other year. We recuperated our losses in three years. So we kind of started really floating up because we were talking to our consumer. And they were connecting, right? It was not just me thinking that they need to, you know, somehow guess. No, they, it was clear. And then we started becoming, we've seen the traction of that. But then also that is uh, another problem because then you start feeling that you're successful and then you think that, you know, you can just be everywhere and then you grow, you grow into places where you don't belong. And then it starts all kind of coming down together again. So those are the teenage years of, of a company, you know, and, and then that you get hit in the head a little bit and then you kind of regroup again, bring it together. And now you're like, okay, now I know where I belong. Now I know what my product product is. I know to communicate, and and 
I'm stable, I can do this really well, and I don't need, need to run into this, you know, mirage of growth. And, and we're not into this game of, you know, exit games and, you know, pump it up and sell it. We're, we're really enjoying so much what we do that we just want to continue doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. And since this is audio only on the podcast, I have to explain that we have your new line of flavors, right? Lying in front of us and the packaging is just so beautiful. And I just love how the images show you exactly what's in the bar. It's just, they look so delicious. There's carrot cake, there's a bacon one, and it's plant-based, yeah. right? It's a new plant-based bacon that we were so happy to come out. It's, it's better than our previous bacon bar. And the Golden Goodness, uh, this one actually won the Sophie Award uh, two years ago. It's best, you know, new uh, milk and white chocolate bar. Because it's kind of confusing because it's a white chocolate bar, but it's caramelized sugar and caramelized milk white chocolate, so it tastes like dulce de leche. But when you put the cacao nibs inside, at the end you have this explosion of cacao, of, of real like dark chocolate. So I like to say that if you grind this bar, you'll have milk chocolate. But like this is decomposed, so you go through the stages of experience. And it's my favorite bar. And the carrot cake was kind of originated by just a joke because we were in, you know, doing a April's Fool's Day. Uh, and we said, oh, carrot cake, you know, healthy chocolate, whatever. And everybody reacted in such a positive way that they said, oh, my God, we got to do a carrot cake. So then I started mixing in ingredients. And, you know, you look at a carrot cake and you say, well, how is this a carrot cake? But when you put it in your mouth, it tastes, it gives you the, the, the experience of a carrot cake. And it's a flourless carrot cake because it's not a cake. But it has all the elements of a carrot cake. And you get the walnuts and you get the spices and you get, you know, the carrot and stuff. And it even gets that sense of cream cheese fill, uh, frosting to it, too. So super fun bar that, that we're just launching this year. And we hope that people connect. And I've seen it. Everybody's, nav- you know, just navigating towards the carrot cake. This, this, I had not I, any idea that carrot cake was so familiar and so thought after. And I'm so happy it is, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to try it. Um, so going back to some of the obstacles, what are some things that you'd do differently if you could start over again? Uh, gosh, yeah. Talk to somebody like me that can tell me how to do it. I know right now. But, um, you know... It is difficult anyways, right? You try trying to get into when you're a startup, you know, passionate brand, getting into distribution is very complex. Uh, one of our biggest and most painful processes was the that getting to retailers through the distributors. The distributors have an immense power. And and it's very as, as you're a small uh, brand, it's hard to really control the variables. And you know, the chargebacks and a lot of things that are very costly. And you don't have the the power of larger brands that can either monitor or fight it. So that was that was very difficult, and um, and honestly, what we wouldn't do again is is thinking that we can belong anywhere, because you don't. <clears throat> you just have to make sure that your demographics are the right ones, and then you instead of thinking that you're going to grow uh, in this measure, you want to make sure that you grow you know, sustainably, and you see places just kind of slowly, organically growing. Versus just because buyers are very enticing. You know, you come in, a big buyer says, they loves your product. I want you to be my you know, 3,000 stores, and you're like, oh, my God, great opportunity. But then maybe you don't belong in those 3,000 stores. The buyer is trying to, to, to enhance his assortment and is in love with your product, which is great. But you have to be a little bit more careful and say, okay, you know, let's just go, you know, let's, let's do a test for 300 stores and 500 stores. And you can really attach your production in line, too, so you don't really go into these stressful moments. Because just as you grow up, you fall down, right? So you want to make sure that, you're steadily climbing the mountain and not just, you know, cruising up where you run out of oxygen. Makes sense. I feel like that would be so helpful for earlier companies to know. Yeah. What was your biggest surprise about getting involved in the specialty food trade? Huh. Biggest surprise. I, I don't know if there was anything like that, a big surprise. Uh, in, a, in a positive way, uh, the welcoming of our brand was a surprise. You know, there's also a little bit of a sense of, of self-sabotage because you're playing with these big companies, you know, that are, uh, and, and having all of them come by our booth and, and look at our packaging and, and take pictures of our packaging, you know, like huge competitors. And somehow it really gives you this sense of, whoa, you know, we feel like we, we're doing something right. So, so that was surprising in a very positive way. And that, of course, feeds your ego and then you can get confused and then you think that you're almighty, but no, you're not. Uh, you're still small. You want to keep going, you know, follow your course. But it was really a very good surprise that, that we would be so respected and, you know, looked after uh, and 
and then of course see companies copying and that's like you know as I say copy is the best uh, you know uh, what do you say that form of flattery right so first you get all pissed but then you say like wow okay yeah. I just keep doing it better totally how has your brand evolved since you first started well, you know, as I was just saying before, it was all about me finding exciting expressions that you'd be surprised. Uh, and uh, then understanding that, you know, no, we want to bring familiar products with new twists, but still within something that you can easily connect to. You don't need to, like, you know, think too hard to see what it is. So we started evolving, you know, like our s'mores bar at first. You know, my branding director was doing all this guerrilla warfare in my office putting big inspirational posters everywhere like oh america needs s'mores more s'mores this s'mores and i'm like i don't know how to do a s'mores bar how do i squeeze a marshmallow inside a chocolate bar but then we decided to put them on top and we found these great vegan marshmallows and we did it and he proved me right wrong because it's our number one selling product so now again a familiar thing you don't have to go through the bonfire experience but you can have a delicious combination that in your mind you're having a s'mores and so we continue doing this approaching our chocolate profiles with things that are familiar so that we invite people to taste them, right? And then when they like it, they can share it. If you're too new, it's a little bit more difficult. You know, we break the thing like the golden goodness is, is not really familiar, but I could not not do this, right? And then we have the firecracker, which is also not familiar or surprising and all that, but it's just so iconic that when people really experience it, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? So, so we keep some of those, but you know, our s'mores bars and your pretzel toffee, and we're doing things that our people connect with, but keeping it really premium and gourmet and, and, and delivering on the promise in the packaging. Awesome. Great. So what do you want people to know about your brand that they might not know already? Well, you know, we are all about sharing joy. Actually, as a company, we don't have a mission. We have an intention, which is to share joy with the world through deliciously engaging chocolate experiences. You know, I feel that, that joy is such a powerful energy. And, uh, and in this world, you know, the moments we have of joy are invaluable. And our chocolate is designed for that. So it is about sharing it. So, you know, buy it and share it because this is, this is, this is our way to, this is our social uh, mission to bring joy to the world. You know, so many people have other social missions about agricultural initiatives and stuff like that, but ours is to, to really have, offer you the opportunity to be with yourself and indulge in something that's gonna bring you joy. Because I believe that it just makes your organic, your system works better, your emotional and biological system works better when your energetic system is vibrating at the right frequency, right? You're not down, you're really up and joyful. So, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great option for having a moment of joy and sharing it with people. And if the people do that, then they help, help us fulfill our intention to share joy. Mm -hmm. And you refer to this often as sustainable joy, correct? Yeah. It has to be sustainable joy. Otherwise, it's, it's a, it can get addictive in a way that it's just too much of a jolt. This has to be something that, that you feel it, you share it, and, and it just grows and grows and grows. comes back to you again. That's beautiful. We're almost out of time. But before you go, we'd like you to participate in our final segment. So first, we'll pause for a brief break, and then we'll jump into the final questions. Uh-oh. Test. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. What is your favorite thing about the specialty food industry? The, the crowd it attracts. Foodies, fun people, creative people. And, uh, and when you share your passion with passionate people, you're in the right group. Awesome. Um, if you weren't running a business, what do you think you would be doing? 
<laughs> uh, dancing, salsa, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I would be learning, studying, studying new ways of looking at life. Cool. Love that. What's one piece of advice you'd give a new food business? Uh, to, to get out of your head and look around. Because no matter how good your idea is, uh, it's no good at all if it doesn't connect with the consumer. So, and, and I don't believe in this, like, you know, the consumer is always right. That's not something I'm saying that to let the consumer create your idea, that's, that's fake too. That's, you know, like, that's like uh, marketing through, through fo- focus groups. You have to have your passion, but you can't be blind. You know, just really sound it and, and take criticism. Don't fight it off just because you're so passionate and in love with it. And it sounds like you're always checking in and you personally are always really mindful of, you know, not letting ego get in the way or take you to a place you don't want to go to. Yeah, and you want to be with people that actually call you out, right? So if, if, if everybody tells you what you're doing is delicious, you're, nobody's guiding you in any way because they're doing it because they love you. And, 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 but if they, they're really honest and, and, and then suddenly it shakes you because you're like, come on, what do you mean you don't like it? No? And I'm like, ooh, you know, your ego has to be checked and you got to go, okay, well, let's talk about this again. And because otherwise you'll just be alone there thinking that you're Superman and nobody cares for you. Mm-hmm. And the last question, how do you define specialty food? How do I define specialty food? Ooh, don't you know how you define specialty food? The Specialty Food Association? <laughs> <laughs> it's a question for you. We'd love to get our guests' interpretation. Um, There's no wrong answer. Well, I think uh, uh, creative, uh, well-sourced, uh, high-quality, um, innovation, so that you have new discoveries and you can evolve the culinary arts forward. Uh, and uh, I'm always very surprised when I see something like incredibly obvious that I'm like, oh, what? Fish jerky? <laughs> so logical. Everybody's looking for protein jerkies or something like that. And how about fish jerky? You know, I saw it here. It was like brilliant. And it's so incredibly obvious. Yeah. So I like it when you see this innovation coming in together and, and, you, and it challenges you to, to be more creative too. Yeah, maybe... Fish will find its way into your bar someday. I don't know if you'll get that <laughs> oh creative. I've tried it. Don't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, a big thanks to you, Michael, for joining us today. And you can find out more about this show at specialtyfood.com and heritageradionetwork.org. And remember to follow wherever you get your podcasts. Come back often to get to know the people who are shaping the future of food. Special thanks again to Michael Antonorsi and to Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. This is Spill It and Dish, a Specialty Food Association podcast.